everybody. How are you? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about boundaries today. And um, <clears throat> I am going to be drawing on some questions that people wrote. I'm going to just give you some ideas about boundaries first, and then I will look at specific questions that people have written in and um, just kind of think through some of these pieces. Um, one thing I want to just say about boundaries to start out with is boundaries have to do with how you're in relationship to other people. And they have to do with what's your responsibility and what's the responsibility of others. And this question gets confused by the fact of our dependency on other people to um, manage our sense of self. And so, as you've probably heard me talk about in the courses and so on, that when we start out in life, we start out in a in native dependency, that we are looking to others to tell us about who we are and whether or not we are sufficient and what it means to love and be loved, okay? And um, <clears throat> when, you're in a, when you're fortunate enough to be in a really functional and loving family, the parents understand that their goal, that their job is to facilitate your growth and development and your ability to take deep responsibility for yourself in your life. And they give you the kinds of supports and limits and encouragement that best facilitate you expressing your uniqueness in the world, living up to your responsibilities, being able to sustain your own uh, psychological functioning. When a family system is dysfunctional, it <clears throat> the parents can manage their own needs, their own neediness is really what I mean to say, their own difficulty with their sense of self by exploiting the dependency of that child. And so it's easy, and this is where boundaries in a sort of native sense get confused, a parent can pressure the child who wants the parent's approval, who wants to feel that they're enough. The parent can pressure for the child to caretake the parent. So in dysfunctional systems, the caretaking doesn't go from parent to child, it, it goes from child to parent often for the psychological functioning. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, for example, I was working with someone recently whose parents were very dysfunctional. The mother was always doing things that were very embarrassing. The father could be explosive. She's trying to manage her sense of safety and she's trying to get the adults in her life to take care of her because that's her only option. And so the way that that gets handled instinctively because it's, it's adaptive for the child is to try to regulate and manage the mother's emotionality and try to take care of the mother and be enough what the mother wants so the mother will pay attention to her. It's trying to manage the father's demandingness and keep him from being angry. And so you naturally, just out of your own desire to be safe, are gonna start taking care of the minds around you to protect yourself, okay? Now, the reason why this is all related to sort of adult functioning is oftentimes the way that you learn those patterns then get played out in adult choosing, adult um, um, relationships. And so the way I talk about it in the Strengthening Your Relationship course is that this is highly related, boundaries are highly related to how much self-respect you have and how much respect for others you have. Uh, it very much relates to how you think about who you are and who you need to be to be sufficient. And so, if you're busy trying to prove to other people that you are worthy or you're worth their time or worth being in relationship to you, you're much more likely to be over-functioning in the relationship. That is to say, doing, taking care of your mind and their mind, trying to get them to be okay with you, trying to manage how they feel about you. And the person on the other side of that tracks that and maybe grew up in an environment where if you're just complain enough, uh, you know, talk about being a victim enough, um, pressure enough, you can get other people to manage your mind for you. And so a lot of times those two people get married, right? And so you easily have 
a system where the boundaries are messed up, there's underfunctioning and overfunctioning, and both are trying to regulate their sense of self. So it's the challenge with one sense of self that interferes with good judgment around what is about me and what is not about me. Okay, <clears throat> now even if you grew up in the most perfect of families and you learn these things well, it's still some, you know, you still are going to develop in the world. You still have things to sort out in your relationship. Is, is this my problem? Am I being unfair? If I believe differently than my spouse, am I doing them harm? You know, or is it, am I being flippant about what it means to them? Those are important questions and um, they exist for all humanity to sort out what is my responsibility and what is not my responsibility. <clears throat> but the more that our sense of self is, is playing into that, <clears throat> then uh, the more limited your ability to see through it might be. So let me just give you a couple more examples and then we, I can um, go to the questions. But um, actually, I'll say a little bit more educationally to, before I go to the questions. But um, another way you might have, so when I talk about your sense of self, it's also linked to your identity. Okay, so, um, you know, what I think my challenge is, is I have very much an identity of being a helpful person, that I help others. Okay, so if someone's saying you're not being helpful, that's like, oh, you know, no, I'm a helpful person, <laughs> you know, or that if someone's in distress, it's very familiar to me to want to uh, alleviate the distress. Now, that sounds very good and, you know, it doesn't sound like a limitation, but it is a limitation because sometimes that's not helpful to do that. You know, I was doing this a bit with my son. Like if I'm going in and trying to solve and trying to support and doing more than is actually ultimately beneficial for him because part of helping people is not about you being dependent on them, right? It's about them sorting out their own strength, taking more responsibility for their lives. And if you're busy being a solver and you're actually infecting that process because your sense of who you are is too linked to that idea, then you actually are not helpful, okay? You're actually interfering because of your own limited sense of self. So, so, you know, a lot of times we have identities that have been shaped by our experience and part of growing into deeper maturity is to see those liabilities or limitations, to push yourself against them, to not run in and be the savior, to tolerate the anxiety and that, just speaking from my experience. And then, and then you expand your sense of self. Uh, you see the good that comes from it. You learn how to take deeper responsibility for yourself and your role and let others take responsibility for themselves. I think this is an easy place to get it confused. So, um, so I think that, um, so, so those are just some ideas of thinking about how you think about who you are. <clears throat> for You could be somebody who thinks, I need everybody else to help me. I've never been good at helping myself. Therefore, I'm justified in pressuring people to help me out because I'm insecure because I don't know how to do these things, because I, I feel so much self-doubt, therefore I need your help. You know, that's, that's also a sense of self issue. So it's very easy to go around then pushing other people to prop you up rather than stopping yourself from that pattern and taking more responsibility for your fallibility, for your difficulty, but getting stronger in the process of not going and trying to get other people to fill in. Okay, so one more thing I was gonna say about boundaries, and let me just pull up my document here because I haven't yet. Um, let's see. Um, just another thing, I talk about this in the relationship course as well, but um, I, I talk about it in terms of both protective boundaries and um, containing boundaries. This is a Terry Real idea. Actually, it might be a Pia Melody idea that I read in his book, but anyway. So the, the protective boundary is a self-respecting boundary. That is, you are going to set limits with people as a function of self-respect. So if somebody is taking from you, is exploitative, is trying to pressure you against your own integrity or well-being, a protective boundary will limit or stop that, um, that y y it, again, okay, what, sorry, I'm gonna take two things about that. Boundaries are not about controlling other people. So this is a very important point. 
a boundary is not about getting other people to do the right thing. And this, it's very confusing for people. You're not, you're not respecting my boundary, okay? Uh, that's the idea that you need to be doing what I have set up as the rules. Boundaries are about self-definition. They are about what you're gonna do vis-a-vis -vis the other people in your life. Who are you gonna be? You can't control all those other factors. The quicker you get clear about that, the more the issue of boundaries gets cleaned up, okay? So you're not going to solve other people and their choices. Those always reside with them. Boundaries is about who am I gonna be in this situation and what decisions am I gonna make given the choices that people I care about are making? What are the choices I can respect? What are the choices that I think are functional, that are self-respecting and also other respecting? So protective boundary is more about the self-respect. A containing boundary is respect for others. So if I'm, um, you know, just taking back to my son, is that if I'm like over-functioning, okay, well, first of all, that's the fantasy that if I do enough, I can solve his distress. That's a fantasy. It's one I happen to like. It's a fantasy. So me engaging that fantasy is more about how I want to see myself, that I don't want to tolerate his agency and his ability to make choices that I can't control, that either he will invest in his life or he won't. So this is, you know, and so, but my, my going in, not engaging a good containing boundary, okay, I actually go and interfere with his process, okay? You know, I've found as I like, don't do that, it leaves the dilemmas on him in a way that's been much more valuable for him, much more useful, but anxiety evoking for me because I have to tolerate what I don't have control over while I give him the chance to control what he does have control over. So that's a containing boundary. I know some of you are asking questions. So I will try to come back to them. Um, let me just see this one here. What does setting boundaries look like for a more anxiously attached, needy partner? I want more closeness with my wife, ostensibly, so I struggle with understanding what setting healthy boundaries looks like for me. Are they actually more to protect her? Yes. If the primary wrong I feel from her is emotional and sexual disengagement, I guess I don't see how I can set a boundary around that exactly other than just not letting myself try to control her choices. Yeah, you're seeing, I think, I think you're seeing your wife as the source of your well-being, and you're trying to get her validation to sustain your sense of self. When you're in a frame of my wife doesn't give enough and she's frigid and rigid and uh, withholding, that idea justify. now she may be all those things, I, you know, I'm not, <laughs> but, that idea justifies your taking. So you're using your, just to be really straight about it, you're, you're using your neediness to justify taking what's not being offered. I'm not saying she shouldn't offer it, or what I mean is, I'm not saying what she's choosing is necessarily healthy, it could be, but that you trying to take what's not being given or asking her to manage your sense of self in the name of love is to do two things. One is to be entitled to take something not being offered, even if you deserve it. It doesn't mean you can t you should take what's not offered. But also, it justifies her feeling that this is somebody who wants to suck the life out of me, so I want to put up a wall. So a lot of times these, you know, in the relationship course, I talk about walled off people versus boundaryless. Well, obviously, a lot of times these people get married because or I should say, even if they weren't clear who they were, that pattern emerges because the one who tends to get others' approval to manage their sense of self is going to quickly facilitate in the one who tends to feel like they have to manage the people around them a quick wall because they don't want to feel, maybe it feels good in dating, but, but they don't want to feel that they're constantly being um, pressured to caretake. It's not attractive it's easy to avoid. And then the walled off person has, in this case, her own anxieties, her own questions around her value, but she can use the needy husband to justify not stepping in more, not exposing more of who she is, which of course makes him feel more needy. So it's a pattern that's a self-regulation challenge on both sides. 
but the boundary is with yourself. That's where you start. I'm trying to feel okay about me by getting her to love me in the way I want her to. I can't do that. I can think it's bad judgment on her part, but I'm not gonna punish her, pressure her. I'm gonna regulate myself better because that's the only way to give her a real choice for starters, but also to allow her, well, allow you deeper self-regulation, which you need to be in any intimate relationship because if you're in a need frame in a relationship, it's not about intimacy, it's about caretaking. It's I can't handle myself, that's why I'm with you. <laughs> that's not love, okay, that's taking. So it's an opportunity for you to get better at regulating your own emotions, regulating your own feelings, um, <clears throat> so that you're more desirable because it's not so costly to be with you, but also because you're, you're managing your own psychological weight and you're stronger and better for doing that. And so this isn't just about her or being a desirable guy to her, but about being a desirable person to yourself, about feeling more whole. And, um, and so this ability to handle ourselves is adult development. It's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, we are validation gluttons. We love it. <laughs> okay. My, all of us, all of us. And so validation feels great and the, and it certainly makes sense, but, we have to push against that in ourselves if we're gonna really be free and we're really gonna be strong. And so this partnership, your marriage is giving you that opportunity um, if you keep yourself contained in this way. Now, you can, I'll say one more thing about it and then I'll move on. You can, um, if you're really self-regulating, you can talk about what you desire or what you'd like or what, you can invite your wife into connection with you. Um, but that's different than pressuring neediness, you know, when are you gonna love me like you should? And so you really gotta start with yourself here to see what am I doing and am I really managing myself here or not? And, and am I justifying her wall? And her wall is immature too, but am I making it easy for her to be immature in this way? Okay. Um, Hang on, I'm just gonna scroll down. There's lots, huh? Okay, there's a lot of extra questions here. I don't know if I'll be able to get to all these. Two things I wanna say, just remember, anything you post um, is public to the group of 12,000 people, <laughs> okay? So just make sure you're not, your responsibility, your privacy is your responsibility here. So just make sure you're not saying anything about yourself that you'll later regret or about a spouse especially important because they're not giving consent for you to talk about them. If you want something posted, you can private message Christy. Um, do we have a way for them to do that, Christy? I'm not sure how to do that. Because then she could put it in just as an anonymous post. So I just a reminder I give every time. I just want to kind of say that again to people. Uh, let's see, Caitlin says, after we regulate ourselves and are more whole, how do we find that connection without neediness and validation seeking? still trying to understand this concept. It's an excellent question because I remember myself being like, well, what else is there? If you don't need the person, like, why are you with them? <laughs> it's such a cheap view of love, right? But it's, it's a very human one. You listen to pop music, it's all about, I need you, baby, I need you. That's why I love you so much. Well, need is not love. Need is I want to get something from you to manage me and I'll think you're awesome for it. Or at least we think we will. We don't actually, because we can often resent the people we need. but. But, you know, sort of like if I don't need them, then why wouldn't I just be like all by myself in my house with, you know, my cat? Um, so I think that what it's hard to understand until you start to experience it is that once you actually can sustain your sense of self, you do feel you are, you know, you can be at peace. Well, you're not trying to get them for your psychological functioning. Now you may say, I, I like you. My life is richer with you in it. I want a friendship with you. I want to build a life with you because my life is richer and better for having you in it. That's still different than I can't manage myself. So will you take care of me for life and we'll call it love? <laughs> That's, you know, a lot of us when we're getting married are trying to lock in someone 
to manage our sense of self, give us a place in society, give us legitimacy, manage our anxieties about, you know, being able to sustain ourselves economically. And so a lot of times there, I think for a lot of us, it's like lock somebody in that has to love me before and do it before they know too much. <laughs> okay. And I don't think we admit these things to ourselves, but I think that um, it's, a, it's an easy way to try to mitigate the vulnerability of really letting somebody in on who you are, especially when you're not yet at peace with who you are. You can't, really want someone to know you if you think you have parts of yourself that are unacceptable and that you don't want to have be knowable and so your capacity for intimacy is very linked to your ability to sustain yourself psychologically to be honest with yourself so what you start to see when you're when you're more able to do this is that you desire someone because you value them because you love them, you respect them, you care about them as a person and their own functioning and their own needs and their own beliefs and their own ideas because you're not trying to get them to reinforce you all the time. And of course, it feels good when they do reinforce you. It feels good when they do validate you. So there's nothing wrong with that. But you can also function and be decent and be a friend even when you're not getting that validation. That's, that's the measure. And you can stay honest because you can't really have love without honesty. If a love relationship is based on something dishonest, it isn't love. <laughs> well, it's only love to the degree that it's honest. And so, so I think a lot of us are in that struggle that we would prefer a needing frame. I need you, I need to be needed by you to something more honest and where there's really choices. Okay, but that's at the core of healthy boundaries is this ability to manage our, sense, our own functioning. So um, let me just go to the questions again. Um, as he says, if neither person needs the other, they have established their own independent lives and hence nearly no place their lives, in, in no place do their lives intersect seems an empty existence. Well, yeah, but what I think you're saying is that to intersect is because you need. That's not, that's not true. I mean, you can intersect with someone's life because you care about them, because you hold their interests in your heart, because you like sharing a life with them, uh, because you are invested in their well-being and their happiness. And so, and you share projects together. You share the efforts of building a life together, you building a family together. It doesn't have to be need framing. The attachment doesn't have to be around need. Absolutely does not. If you think about your friendships, are you hanging out with them and, and going climbing together because you need each other? No, I mean, because you value each other and you're finding shared interests and things that you enjoy doing together. So um, I think it can be sometimes more challenging in intimate relationships because we burden our intimate relationships with a lot more demand our sense of self is much more um, exposed in an intimate partnership in a way that it isn't with somebody that you might get lunch with or go to the gym with. And so we put a lot more demand on our partnerships and when they fail us, okay, uh, we can manage our sense of self in that through resentment, through capitulation, through all these things that um, actually make this sort of choice-based intersection that's not about need it, it obscures it it makes it harder to see okay so let me go to the questions here um all right okay um this person just said please try to read this without judgment i'm not sure it doesn't seem like a, a, a question one would judge but um as i would like to learn from others opinions and experiences Boundaries. This was talked about a little bit in a recent post. Sounds like this person has been judged for her choices is what it seems to me. This was talked a little bit in a recent post. So what does this look like? For my personal situation, I felt very disrespected at the beginning of my marriage. We fought constantly, and I'm not saying it was all my husband's fault, but some very harsh things were said by him several times. Our therapist talked about boundaries. So what do I do when it continues to happen? How do you set those boundaries and let your spouse know how serious you are about it? What if they keep overstepping that boundary? Um, 
So just one thing I'd say right there is you have a right to set a boundary, okay? Obviously, that's a self-defining frame of what you're willing to participate in or not participate in, what, what you'll accept in a sense, but they have a right to cross it. And I'm not trying to say, you know, you can say, I'm not going to be in a partnership where I'm being verbally assaulted. And they could say, oh yeah, well, I'm going to see. <laughs> okay. They have a right to do it. It's, again, it's not about controlling the other person. It's about controlling yourself in the face of that. Who am I going to be? What am I going to do if this person is verbally contemptuous towards me? How will I handle myself in that? So this is about controlling what you do have control over. It's very uh, easy to want to control other people. It's very instinctive for us to imagine there's got to be some way we can do it. Recently, I was working with a client and she's constantly setting up contracts with her, her spouse out of a fantasy that I can get him to be verbally obligated to something that makes me comfortable. And, but her goal in the name of something as noble as a contract or a, um, you know, agreed upon decision is really about trying to get him to dot, 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 whatever makes her feel more comfortable. So, so again, so again, so you have every right to define the terms of your participation. And I think it's absolutely right to say, I, I don't want to be a part of or participate in a marriage where I'm going to be verbally slandered okay that that's that's a self-respecting boundary uh, i'm not saying these things are easy because how do you actually handle it in the moment right that's not easy but getting the focus on the right question is going to help you tremendously rather than how do i get this guy to do the right thing what am i really going to do who am i really going to be um okay so uh, let's see so after one more fight, which I thought was the biggest, I made the decision to kick him out. I was ready for a separation. Some said this was sexist or entitled because he has a right to the house and bed as much as I do. But I didn't know how else to let him know how serious I was. I was tired of the disrespect. That sounds reasonable. He left, but came back hours later. I could have left and I made the decision to save money so I could if it happened again, which is smart, okay? You're, you're making a plan of like, I'm, I need to be prepared to act if I need to. Um, but it actually never happened again. He never said those kinds of mean things to me again. Okay. Because what you are showing, I mean, you could have left as opposed to kick him out. I mean, you said go and he went. Okay. But you are saying, this is it for me. I am not going to screw around with this. That's a self-defining moment. And he mapped you as taking yourself seriously. Now, what some people might do is be like, I have told you not to treat me like that. How many times do I have to listen to your apology? But what they're also showing is, I'm obviously gonna to tolerate this. I'm obviously going to imagine that you've got the control over me. And what that does is telegraph that the person can keep getting it away with it, that they can continue to do this and you're not gonna, and they can do it without without consequence. And, and, and so I'm not saying this like, you know, a lot of people take this, they start saying, oh, well, I'm gonna start. <laughs> uh, I don't, they start using it as a way to control their partner out of a kind of self-righteous anger. And I just want you all to be kind of thoughtful about that. This is not about controlling the other person or making them pay. This is about, this is much more quiet and self-regulated. Like, I know I can't keep doing this. I am ready to do something different. If it continues, I will no longer be a part of it. And so it's really around getting yourself to make a decision around who you're gonna be. Um, let, let me finish this and then I'll bring it back to another point. One second, let's see. Uh, so she says he never did those things again. And, I, and I'm, yeah, because he understood that you were gonna take meaningful action. And so he could see that he wasn't gonna pull this off anymore. And that's not only, I mean, whoever is judging you on this, this is good for you. It's also good for him. Like propping up a tyrant, letting somebody indulge their worst behaviors is terrible for you, for kids if you have them, but terrible for him too. 
And a lot of times people that do this kind of stuff didn't have enough meaningful limit put on them as kids. They didn't have a loving parent. They either had parents who were indulgent themselves or would tyrannize the kid if the kid was indulgent or, a, or allow the child to be indulgent. Okay, so, but they weren't setting meaningful limits on the kid who then grows up and does these kinds of, you know, five-year-old moves with no, with impunity, with no limit. I'm not saying you need to be their parent, but I'm saying if you hold a self-respecting position, it's good for everybody. It's not good for people to get away with using others or disrespect for others, ever. Um, okay. Uh, but if some think it wasn't the right way to handle it, this is going back to the questioner, how do you handle it then? How do you keep those boundaries set? Because if a spouse knows those boundaries but doesn't respect them in the heat of the moment, you can't just keep accepting apology after apology, right? Because that is, that is to say, don't take me seriously. Like nothing happened. And, you know, right, in my view, apologies are worthless in a sense. I, I, I mean, I'm not saying that apology can mean something if someone is exposing who they are and saying, I feel a tremendous amount of regret about what I did to you. But it's matched with, that, that's meaningful, but only meaningful if it's matched with changed behavior. The real measure of remorse is a change in behavior. You know, a lot of people, they do it more like repentance of the damned, which is, I'm sorry, feel good about me, make it go away, forgive me, right? Um, but they're not in a self-confrontation. They're not trying to um, manage themselves differently. They're trying to manage you and get you to forgive it so that they, in a sense, don't have to confront themselves, okay? So apologies you have to be really careful with um, for what that mean. Changed behavior is everything. Um, okay, good. So let me just do one more because I can see questions coming in. This is clearly a hot topic because there's a lot of questions today. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get to many of them. I'm just gonna do one more here and then I'll look at what some of the questions are coming in. Um, this person says, my husband will touch me in a sexual manner at random points on any given day. Um, I hate it. It keeps me on edge as I don't welcome it, but I don't perceive he means any harm by it. Now, I think this is very important because I think this questioner then goes on to say that she thinks he does mean harm by it. Okay, so I, th this is important to map accurately. Do I just have a lot of sexual anxiety and I don't, I don't like my husband being sexual or being sexually interested in me? Or do I think that there is something aggressive in it or something where I'm being taken from? Because this really matters for self-defining. You, when you define your boundaries, you want them to be as clear-headed as, as possible. And you want to think like, am I being blind to something? Is this a more self-serving boundary? Or is this a boundary that's really about tracking? Is it protective? Like I'm tracking a kind of disrespect in it. Or am I using a boundary to take advantage of somebody else, right? By not opening up myself, not engaging in an honest way. And so I think that um, this issue of self-definition is not small. It's very, very important. Why do I keep doing it? I mean, I'm sorry, I keep bringing up my son, but <laughs> you know, but that, that was like for me, I had to really think through what am I doing? How am I participating in this? Who is he? Who am I? Am I a part of this challenge he's having? Um, and, and so how do I calibrate? Well, that was not an easy process for me. It took some time to really think through it. I had to think about what I couldn't see about myself. I had to think about how he experienced me. I was trying to get other points of view, you know, um, and th this was last year when my son was having some trouble and so he had a good therapist and so that therapist was a very helpful resource for me to understand myself better and how I was in relationship to him. So, um, okay, let's see. So it says it, I, it says, it keeps me on edge as I don't welcome it, but I don't perceive he means any harm in it. I also don't like 
it if he sexy whistles at me. I just want to exist. I don't want to be his source of pleasure anytime he chooses. So, um, okay, so when you say, I don't want to be his source of pleasure anytime he chooses, again, this is a self-evaluation thing, and the more honest, the better, okay? Which is, is it that I just don't, I don't want to give to this person. I don't want him to have pleasure. I don't, I want to freeze him out. I like the control in it. Okay, that's hypothesis A. Hypothesis B is I feel like this person is extracting from me all the time and doesn't respect that I don't like it. Okay, now, it could be some of both, okay, so for sure. But she says, I just want to exist. I don't want to be his source of pleasure anytime he chooses. So it sounds like she's at least feeling like she's being taken from, that he's using her for his pleasure, quote unquote. Uh, it doesn't seem to feel like it's about being with you. Um, what I would wonder is, I'm sure he's tracking that she doesn't like it. Okay, even if she doesn't like it, again, because she's frigid and immature, I'm not saying she is, but let's just, go, let's just say like she's just the world's most rigid, closed off partner to nonetheless go do to somebody what they don't want done to them is its own offense. Okay, so um, what I would be interested in is how is he mapping his wife? Does he think she's having a good time? <laughs> Probably not, okay? So why is he doing it anyway? What's justifying it in himself? And um, okay, that's a little different question. So, so um, okay, so, so she, she says, what's the difference between foreplay and flirtation and objectification, or what I would call use? And it has to do with his intention and also your receptivity to him, okay? So when it's flirtatious, it's reciprocal, right? Even if your spouse is like, stop, okay? Like, I know I'm sexy, but stop, <laughs> okay? Well, that's playful. That's reciprocal. That is not about, oh, you know, like you are just so invasive. I can't get, you know, you're constantly pestering me and taking from me when I don't like it. It's a very different picture. Okay, so when it's flirtation, both people are having a good time, even if one's pretending they like it less. <laughs> uh, even if it's this dance of pursuit and resistance it is still a dance you're both participating in. I talked about this in the Art of Loving course, the men's course. I was watching our golden retriever and my mom's puppy, who's a Havanese, play. And the Havanese would, would take on this kind of alpha aggressor position and the big golden retriever would play the beta, the kind of submissive one. Okay, so they're playing in this you know, pursuit and resistance and aggress and submit but it's a game they both absolutely liked. And sometimes when the little dog would, you know, wander away, Sullivan, our dog, would bark at him like, come back and play, <laughs> okay? Clearly they both liked this, okay? So even if you're in this dynamic that can be a part of flirtation, it's mutual, it's shared fun. Um, so, so how do I establish a boundary that allows for desired sexual touch but it eliminates these instances that I don't welcome. So again, you wanna think about it in terms of self-definition and defining the terms of your engagement. And um, I would address with him what it is about the touch that you reject. Because I'm gonna go with how you're thinking of it without knowing maybe more um, here but that you're experiencing it as invasive, as disrespectful, as disrespecting of the fact that he maps that you don't like it and you're feeling taken from, and so it feels devaluing. Um, and so, and he does it even when you reject it. So that's what I would be addressing. I wouldn't be, a lot of times what happens is people start addressing it in terms of, I don't like that. Like, kind of like I have an issue as opposed to the, when you touch me when you know I don't like it. That says a lot to me about how you think about me, okay? That's a problem for me. That's the problem. 
it's not that I don't like sex, it's that I don't like feeling that you're coming at me when I don't want it. it if you can't respect my no, you're not gonna get a yes from me. Now, some people may be like, oh, you're trying to control him. No, that's self-control, okay? Now, he may feel controlled. A lot of times people do feel controlled when you set your boundary, right? Like the woman who's asked her husband to go because he's being verbally abusive, he could probably get people to agree with him that she's being controlling, okay? That's fine. When you start to hold your limits, people do feel that they don't have the choices that they want. But you have to just be honest with yourself. Am I doing it to to um, control the other person or am I trying to control myself relative to the other person? I'm not gonna have an open-hearted sexual relationship with somebody who is won't respect me. I won't do it. Because it, to do it is to debase myself. I don't wanna do it. You can debase me, I can't control that. I can control whether or not I'm in connection with you when you do that. So again, it has implications for him but you're defining the terms of your participation in the partnership. Okay, um, let me just quickly see if there's one more here that I wanna do. Um, okay. There's another good one here. Let me just kind of check into the, what other people are saying. Okay, for me, I have to say no in each instance. My husband doesn't get it that I want to invite him in rather than constantly having to say no. Okay, he might not get it, um, but sometimes it's easy to not get things you don't wanna get. So um, what you have to look at in that question is yourself. Am I just so controlling that, I'm not saying you are, but like just to think about, am I just, so that I need to control everybody. You know, the person I was talking about that's always having contracts. Well, she's trying to manage her sense of sexual safety by micromanaging everything her husband does. My input to her is you trying to control other people will keep you absolutely certainly anxious because you know you can't control other people. You set up contracts with your husband, but you know he's lying to you because he always does. <laughs> you know he's saying yes to you when there's no guarantee that he really means it because he's so busy trying to make you happy with him that he's not trustworthy, but you still are trying to control him. You will never feel secure if you're trying to control what you can't control. Anxiety is about trying to control what you can't control. Resentment is usually about the punishment and anger you feel when you don't have that control. Always harder, but where your development rests is in self-control. So going back to that question, let's see. Um, I have to say no in each instance, but, but I think you want to look at why am I saying no? Is it the way I'm being engaged or is it that I want a ridiculous amount of control? Is it that I have a hard time, uh, receiving? Is it that I have a hard time owning my own desires when I track his desires? Is it that it's the way he approaches me? Okay. Do I play a role in always being approached in this way that I don't like? Okay, I'm not trying to excuse him, but more that if I only have me to control, I better get a clean look at what I'm doing. And, um, and then if, if I've got a hold of what I'm doing, I'm more in a position to hold a healthy position, to hold a self-respecting position, to hold a position that will pressure us forward than if I'm just you know vilifying him and or trying to control him. If you think like, I really do have a spouse who will not respect my no, well, that's an important issue to take up and say that's a big deal for me, okay? But it's not coming, again, from trying to manage him, but being honest about yourself in that relationship. I cannot be okay with that. So if you wanna be okay with me, you've gotta respect what I'm saying to you. Your choice, but these are the terms of my participation. Okay, so my question is, my husband tells me that he doesn't like chatting or texting because he does this for work, but has zero issue doing these things for random people, especially women. Hmm. He doesn't want to put the work into our marriage because he's an introvert, but has no problem putting it in the work for friendship relationships. He wants to spend time on video games, phone, electro uh, electronics, basically then is upset that I don't feel close to him. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my love language is quality time and words of affirmation. He doesn't listen to me when I try to talk to him. He just calls me names and tells me that issues are all my fault. My husband said he joined your group because he feels like we are roommates. I agree, but he doesn't want to put any work into having an actual relationship. There's zero connection. We aren't partners, but that's all by his choice. He wants to leave the housework to me and the work of our marriage and expects things to be good. And when I mention divorce, he says, I'm just using him. When wouldn't that be the other way around? Why, I mean, why wouldn't that be the other way around? He's using me to be his maid and for sex when he wants it and doesn't meet my needs. Yeah, okay. Um, let me think about what I want to say about that. Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a little tricky to know because I don't have both views to know that I, that that's the best view. I'm not, you know, questioning your honesty or anything, just kind of like what, what's the, what's the operating system. But it, it sounds like you're, um, pointing to a meaning twist that happens in the marriage where, and this does happen in a lot of marriages, where the spouse is professing to be a victim of, of something from you, when in fact that's precisely what they do to you. Uh, you use me, when in fact they're using you. Um, you know, you don't care about me, you just care about me how it serves you, when in fact that's precisely how they're in relationship to you. And so, just let's assume for the sake of the question that you've got this exactly right, that this is the right view of what he's doing and of yourself in it. I think that, again, you're not going to be able to get validation from your husband of your point of view. He has no interest to validate that view because it blows up his view, the view that justifies his behavior. And if he were to tolerate your view, he would have to grow up and take more responsibility for himself and what he's actually doing in his marriage. Taking advantage of you, justifying it while he does what he wants outside the marriage. So um, this is most definitely a, a place where you have to take responsibility for yourself without his validation. You have to take a deeper self-defining position knowing that he will do his best to push back on it because he has the control he wants currently as long as he has been able to keep you self-doubting on your side of this. So I would really recommend you have a good therapist, you have some good input on this to really work out a clean picture of what's happening and how you're participating in it because it's gonna mean you taking different decisions. Um, I, a lot of times people think that means the only option is divorce. It, it often means you have to be willing to contemplate divorce for any chance of it getting healthy. But it means starting to set limits within the marriage itself in terms of your behavior, right? I'm not willing to have sex with you. Uh, you don't have to, you, I know you're not gonna agree with me, but I'm not okay with you texting other women and uh, not investing in your relationship with me. Uh, well, that's stupid. That's so dumb. How, you you're, have every right to think it's dumb. I'm not willing to do it. Wow, you, you have always been so rigid and so blah, blah, blah. You have a right to think that? This is still what I'm gonna do. I don't agree with you. In fact, my view is you take advantage of me in these ways. But see, you're not trying to prove to him. You're saying, here I am. You're taking advantage of me in my mind. This is not up for debate. I'm not going to do, I'm living according to what I see as, as, as good and valuable for me. I'm not gonna be complicit in your mistreatment. Well, it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You have a right to think it, but you have to decide what you're gonna be because I'm not gonna participate in a marriage where I'm being treated like this. So you're gonna divorce me? Um, We'll have to see what you choose. I would prefer not to, I'd prefer for you to love me, but I'm gonna do what's healthy for me 
and I'll watch and see what you're going to do. But see, you're like, I'm going to define me and do what's right. I hope you'll make good choices. That's up to you. Okay, um, let me just see if there's another. This one says, I need this advice too. My husband doesn't think that trust needs to be built back up, that it should automatically trust again. Okay, I'm not sure which question it's referencing, but clearly that's not true. Is this person that I'm finding shared interest? So that's a different question. I'll just speak to that issue of trust. I've talked about this before in Facebook Lives, but um, one of the worst things you can do for yourself is to be dishonest because you blow up your the issue of your trustworthiness and it's a big price to pay and you know we're all human and we all make mistakes but to really undermine your word to undermine that you are credible that you are what you say you are that you'll do what you say you do is a big price to pay and um and so if you have blown that up and that's become present it's foolishness to ask your spouse to trust you because even if they say they do, they don't. And even if they say they do, you know they don't. <laughs> now you maybe want them to act trustingly so you don't have to deal with your life and deal with yourself. But that's not the basis of an honest and intimate marriage. The more honest response is, of course you don't trust me. You Every, every reason to not trust me, I've been untrustworthy. It's good judgment to doubt me. So I'm not asking you to trust me. I am, as I am with myself, committed to being trustworthy, but there's no reason why you need to know that yet. And I even wonder, I'm very good at not being trustworthy, but I'm on it. And you can decide if I'm being straight with you or not. Okay, but that's entirely on the person themselves, that they have made a commitment to themselves and God about the kind of person they're gonna be. And they're not trying to convince anybody. And even if they are, they're like, well, I can see why you wouldn't. I'm not going to ask you to think something that's not true. So, uh, but the, the onus is on themselves. Whenever somebody's like, you won't forgive me. You, I mean, it's just proof positive right there that this person is obsessed with how you see them, not with who they are. That makes them fundamentally a bad person to trust because they're more concerned about how they're viewed, not about their own character and what kind of person they are. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, you can learn more about boundaries and self-respect and all that in the Strengthening Your Relationship course. Okay, thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great long weekend, and I'll see you next month. Bye.